Hi, good evening. Can everybody hear me? Good evening. If you'd want to come and sit and get comfortable with us, I'm Stephanie Thoburn. I'm the Assistant Director of Planning and Zoning. Um, thank you for coming and taking the time to come out here today to our Community Redevelopment Agency public input meeting. Um, so we really want to get your input. And um, there's really three ways that we're going to be asking you to give us your input. Uh, here in person, we're going to have Marty, um, who, who is there, walking around. We'll also have it on the website, a, a QR code, and then also um, in an email form as well. So uh, let me just take a, a few moments to introduce um, everybody who's here from the staff and the council. The Mayor Jim Koretsky in the back waving his hand up there. As, and then also uh, Councilor Sundstrom was here. I saw her. There she is, okay, okay standing in the back there. And then um, Councilor Cameron May. Where are you? Oh, okay. Well, I'll make sure um, we, we acknowledge him when he comes back in. And then also our staff is here. Um, up at the table here is Thatcher Hart. He's one of our newest planners and a, and a uh, homegrown Jupiter boy, young man, excuse me. And, um, and then Marty, as you saw. Um, also, I want to acknowledge the IS department because we've... Um, we we'll want to make sure we hear you clearly, and they've done a fabulous job here. There's Scott Castile in the back, Edwin. Um, Carl is here somewhere. There, there you are, Carl. Um, and then also, um, last but not least, um, Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council is here. Uh, Dana Little, he is the Director of Urban Design from Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council. And um, Kim Delaney, who will be facilitating the discussion today, she is the Director of Strategic Policy and Planning. Close. Okay. So. Close She's enough. really smart, you guys. She has a PhD. So um, <laughs> I'm going to – and then I'm sorry. Tom Lanahan, the Director of, of the Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council, is also here right up front making sure we all do what we should be doing. Super. So, so um, I want to I wanna, uh, pass it off to Kim Delaney here and um, – Thank you again for coming. And we're going to put up um, the information on how you can, if you're not here and you're online, um, or if you look at it later on the website, how you can give us your input later as well. All right? There you go. So let me just cue over to that slide for the input slide. So, so good evening. Kim Delaney from Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council. Can you guys hear me okay? Is the mic good? Okay, super. I will try not to project louder than the microphone can handle. So, um, uh, so thank you for the uh, opportunity to work with the community. There, there are a lot of familiar faces that we've had a chance to engage with um, in uh, the early public outreach uh, for the CRA plan update. Um, and so, um, so thank you for sticking with the process. And for those of you that are here for the first time, uh, glad, glad that you could make it. Let me just get an idea of who's in the crowd, if I can. So um, how many of you are residents in the town of Jupiter? Just to get a feel. So mostly residents, wonderful. Um, how many people have been here for at least one year? At least five years, keep your hand up. At least 10 years. So, and then I'll just ask 20 years. Really amazing, actually, so to have that kind of consistency. So uh, keep going. Uh, 30 years, 30, 40, multi-generational. Multi-generational, still a hand up in the back. So, a couple of hands. So, okay, super. So, and then just in terms of um, your experiences in town, um, how many people have kids that went through school in Jupiter? How many people have kids that went through school? Okay. Um, and then how many have grandchildren that go through school? So, okay, so I'm pretty good. Is, is, do, you, do we need to turn it up? Is that better? So, sorry about that. So, um, so um, how many people have been on the river walk? More than a few? How many people have picked up a shell on the beach? Do you use the beaches? Okay. Uh, how many people have toasted the sunset at a waterfront restaurant? More than a few. Okay. There's lots of great things to do in Jupiter, and that's really one of the things that makes it just such a unique place. So, that's very helpful for me. I'm a native, and I actually grew up down the street. 
So I grew up in North Palm Beach and Palm Beach Gardens and lived in Jupiter um, through my journey. So, um, so I have the, the good fortune of that as part of my background. Um, and tonight, of course, we're talking about updating the, the Community Redevelopment Agency plan. As Stephanie mentioned, uh, the town has a Community Redevelopment Agency that was established back in 2003. Um, and uh, that plan covers the properties that are um, in, uh, uh, include the inlet, uh, the inlet village, about uh, 250 acres of upland property and about 150 acres of submerged land. So just for focus, that's the focus for tonight. Um, there are lots of things going on in Jupiter. Um, and there are lots of things the town can do. But there are only certain things the town can do with its community redevelopment agency. So I want to talk about those distinctions a little bit um, as we go through the discussion tonight. So, And I think Stephanie may have forgot to mention that we have other um, town staff here as well. Uh, Frank, uh, the town manager, as well as Kate, the deputy town manager, who are here tonight. Uh, so I didn't want to leave them out. Um, as Stephanie mentioned, there are multiple ways to participate um, in the uh, in the workshop this evening. And so uh, we have an opportunity for public input um, directly in tonight's workshop later, uh, after I get through a couple of background slides. But in addition, if you aren't comfortable talking on the mic or would prefer to submit information online, um, that QR code on the screen takes you over to a survey document where you can actually just uh, enter questions into the record or, or comments into the record. We can try to address them tonight or just carry them forward through the process. Okay, so I wanted to give that to you, and I'll put that up again later in the presentation so you have that. And in addition, that QR code is on this guy, which are the flyers that were handed out when you came in. Okay? So by way of background, some introductions. Um, uh, I Coast Regional Planning Council and have been for actually 20 years now, which is hard for me to realize, but it is true. Um, the regional planning councils were established back in the 1970s. There are 10 regional planning councils in Florida, and we're designed to do work like this. We're designed to help local governments um, with technical assistance, with planning assistance, urban design. We handle emergency management. We work on environmental systems. Uh, so we really exist as an extension of local government staff. Uh, the Treasure Coast region has four counties. Palm Beach, Martin, St. Lucie, and Indian River counties. So those are the counties identified in the map on that slide. And we have uh, just about uh, two, 2 million people, about 3,700 square miles, um, four counties, uh, about a total of 52 municipalities. Um, so um, a, uh, a small staff, but a staff that comes really from a lot of local government experience. Uh, we have 10 staff, and we work all over the region, and we actually work across the state as well. <clears throat> the scope of work the town's asked us to undertake um, is really in three parts. Uh, we've been working with the town staff, uh, doing background and due diligence, trying to understand the background conditions, what's been happening in the CRA, um, what, um, what's been the history, where are things now, and where do condi conditions and, um, and uh, investment opportunities seem to be trending towards. Uh, so that background due diligence and research is part one. Uh, part two is public engagement conversations like this. We've had a bit of public engagement now for the past couple of months. Uh, so we had a, a workshop with the CRA board back in November, and then we've been conducting a whole series of stakeholder interviews and focus group interviews, so there are many familiar faces from that process, just to try to get insight into what, um, how the CRA is performing. Um, are, are the things that the CRA is doing that you love? Are there things that are challenging? Um, and are there other opportunities to think about? Uh, so this is all part of that public input process. Uh, with all of that input, uh, our next piece of work will then be to actually draft amendments to the CRA plan. We'll be doing that in the balance of, um, of the spring and into the summer. There will be additional opportunities for public input as the CRA board considers those recommendations to modify the plan and then ultimately bring it to adoption sometime in the summer. Um, so that's the overview. Um, and just a slide just to touch on schedule. Um, again, we're underway with our public outreach tonight with our public workshop with, um, with the community, um, and then we'll be drafting those plan amendments um, in the next couple of months to bring them forward to the CRA board um, over the summer. So a couple of pop quiz questions just to see if everybody's paying attention to what's happening in Jupiter. I love to have an opportunity to really dig into a little bit of the history to get some fun facts. So pop quiz number one about the Jupiter Lighthouse. So the Jupiter Lighthouse, if you're going to think about what makes the town of Jupiter a place, certainly the lighthouse is the most celebrated, iconic structure in the town, which is really remarkable. 
um, and, uh, and has been sitting at its highest point since uh, the 1860s. It's the oldest structure in Palm Beach County. But a question for you. How many lighthouses do you think are remaining in the U.S.? So you think it's in the 100, 200 range, 500, about 800, 1,000? So answer is we have 779 lighthouses in the U.S. So just thought that was a cool fact. And how many do you think are in Florida? Sorry? How many are in Florida? Dozen? 30. 30 lighthouses in Florida. So we have one of the 30 that are remaining. Kind of a cool statistic, I thought. So um, environmental resources and their protection is a high priority of the town and highly emphasized in the CRA plan. Um, and so the town has been aggressive in, and very successful in restoring miles of shoreline habitat uh, with living shorelines and putting in uh, mangrove, um, mangroves and oyster ball, oyster oyster balls and, um, and reef structures. So, and um, as part of that, oysters play kind of a pivotal role in uh, cleaning the waterways. So just if you were curious and you were looking at your random oyster, how much water do you think that random oyster would be able to clean in about a day? So is it enough to fill a coffee pot? Is it enough to fill a bathtub? Is it enough to fill a kiddie pool or enough to fill a swimming pool in a typical day? And the answer is... A small bathtub. So 50 gallons, actually, is what the number says. So oysters are playing a very important role for us. So um, oldest oysters, just if you're curious, happen to be about 150 million years old. And the oldest and, and oyster lifespan, my mom was very upset to hear this, dealing with um, having uh, 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 house pets that are going through a, an aging cycle. Oysters live 25 to 30 years. Unbelievable. So I didn't realize that. Um, so if you were to protect your oysters... Um, third question, uh, Jupiter is known internationally for having a healthy outdoor lifestyle with kayaking and scuba diving and boating and fishing and beach walking. Um, and so if you had a chance to frequent the waters offshore, what you find are Goliath grouper that migrate and spend time in the wrecks offshore because we have a remarkable habitat. So if you were to meet a random Goliath grouper and it was of the larger species, how big could a Goliath grouper likely be? What is the biggest Goliath grouper recorded in Florida? It is, what are the, what are the thoughts from over here? 990? Anybody thinking 120? 120 is a little light. So well, if you were wondering, largest Goliath grouper recorded in Florida, 680 pounds. It was almost nine feet long. So if you've been diving off Jupiter, which I've had the good fortune of doing, and you're on a reef and you look to the side and you see a creature the size of a Volkswagen Beetle, that actually is the size of a Goliath grouper off the shore of Jupiter, which is, I think, kind of cool. But really a testimony to the tremendous work the town has been doing in maintaining its access to resources and the quality of the waters um, that, um, are, that surround us. One of the other characteristics that is compelling is that Jupiter really is the, the centerpiece of the Treasure Coast, which is... Um, uh, is significant, right, in that we're with the Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council, this coast of Florida, has actually 1,300 wrecks offshore, <clears throat> pardon me, which is the highest concentration of wrecks offshore with any stretch of coast in the U.S. Um, and the, um, the precipitor to the moniker, the Treasure Coast, was actually a um, treasure fleet uh, from 1715 that had 12 ships, Making, its way, making their way back from Havana back to Spain. Eleven of them sunk. There are a couple of folks here that I know have tremendous knowledge about, uh, about the, treasure, uh, the treasures offshore. Uh, so that said, um, those ships were loaded up with cargo, um, and 11 of those ships sunk to the bottom. If you were guessing, how many pieces of silver do you think were recorded on those ships? Sorry? 15 million? Any takers for more? 25? You're right, 15 million. 15 million pieces of silver, uh, not all of which have been recovered. So if you don't have access to a metal detector, worth investing. So last question, and then I'll get to the meat of it. So Jupiter's River Walk, um, which has been a focal part of the discussion as we've been going through our outreach process, is notable for lots of different reasons. So most of the town of Jupiter doesn't live with the water in the backyard. 90% of residents in Jupiter, don't have water in their backyard. So the way they get to the water, in large part, is using the Riverwalk because it gives us access to recreation. 
It gives us access to natural resources, and it also connect, interconnects the mix of uses that you have in the community. So um, you can get to residential uses, commercial uses, entertainment, um, and recreation, as well as natural areas. So it's not just a it's not just a recreational feature. It's actually it's a transportation facility, a multimodal piece of the multimodal transportation network. So one of those facilities it connects to is the Jupiter Ridge Natural Area. We've had a chance to better understand the characteristics of those natural areas that are um, that are in the town. And the Jupiter Ridge is very interesting. It is actually the um, it has the most coastline of any natural property controlled by Palm Beach County. So it's significant in that regard. Um, and it's a very diverse piece of habitat. So um, there are different things going on with the shoreline um, and then the upland area. So if you were wondering how many kind of habitat types might be there, so question for you, how many do you think there are? So do you think it has sand pine scrub, scrubby flatwood, mesic flatwood, depression marsh, or mangrove swamp? All of the above is the answer, all of the above. So one of the most diverse properties controlled by Palm Beach County and the longest coastline, and the river walk connects directly to it, which is really, I think, a cool feature to have um, in the community. So, so that said, um, we've touched a little on the history of Jupiter. Jupiter's, uh, Jupiter's history, of course, um, uh, predates most of the settlement along the east coast of Florida um, and has an array of um, of Spanish, um, Spanish occupation, uh, British occupation, a Native American presence as well. Um, and, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, the lighthouse, of course, iconic from the 1860s, um, really um, marking Jupiter as um, a marine destination. Um, it had the shortest railroad in the United States. I know that's a fact that my director, Tom Lanahan, enjoys since he's a train enthusiast. Uh, the Celestial Railroad was only seven and a half miles running from Jupiter down to Lake Worth. And we still have the vestiges of that as a resource to celebrate um, in, um, in the town and particularly in the CRA. So the Community Redevelopment Plan, again, was ad adopted in 2003. Um, and I think it's valuable to touch on, just for a moment, a little CRA 101. Because I know most of you already know everything about CRAs and can probably teach the class. But for those that don't, I just wanted to take a couple of minutes kind of zoom out for a moment and frame the discussion for tonight. Because CRAs can do lots of things, but they can't do everything. So CRAs are dependent special districts that are available for Florida, uh, Florida local governments, both counties and cities, that are designed to really support economic development and redevelopment within a particular district. Okay? Um, there are 217 CRAs in Florida, just if you were curious. So it's a very popular mechanism. So, and um, within the Community Redevelopment Act, which is codified in Chapter 163, <clears throat> there are some very specific rules under which CRAs must function. So CRAs can only be established when a local government identifies um, a, uh, through a, what's called a finding of necessity, uh, characteristics that evidence that conditions are deteriorating and special redevelopment assistance is necessary to remedy them, okay? Um, so, um, so CRAs can only be located in those areas. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. CRAs are public agencies. They can be controlled either by a town council, like as is the case in the town of Jupiter. They can sometimes operate with an independent board. Less common, but happens in some communities. Um, and they can only focus their investment dollars in the geographic area in which the CRA is formed. So what can CRAs do? What are they, what's the purpose of a CRA? CRAs are designed to remedy deteriorating conditions through things like infrastructure investment, capital improvements, land acquisition. CRAs can take on code enforcement and policing. Um, they are designed to encourage private investment. And then they can also undertake other locally prioritized projects and programs. But one of the things that I think is always important to emphasize is that CRAs do not change zoning. They don't change land use. They don't approve development. So those are functions that reside with the, um, the uh, local government in which a CRA is located. We have had lots of discussions through the public engagement process about what's the purpose of the CRA and what can the CRA do. So I wanted to make that distinction with you, um, just so we are all we're kind of operating with the same information. So CRAs can address projects and programs um, and make, um, make priority recommendations. However, zoning and land use those things remain with the town. And so those won't happen in the CRA plan, and they're not supposed to. 
Those are supposed to remain with the elected body under which a CRA exists. Um, one of the ways CRAs are typically financed, and that's the case in the town of Jupiter, is through what's called tax increment financing. So tax increment financing, which is also referred to as TIF, the acronym TIF, tax increment financing is a special financing mechanism only available to CRAs in Florida. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, in some states, TIF can be used in other locations, but in Florida, TIF can only be established in an approved CRA district. And the way tax increment financing works is that when a CRA is established and a TIF district is established, the value, the taxable value of all those properties in the district are, um, are calculated. Um, and the city and the county, for the next 30 years or 40 years or however long the agency will exist, continue to get the taxes on the base value. But as values go up, the taxes on the additional increment of value, so the tax increment, are redirected from both the city and the county into what's called a redevelopment trust fund. That redevelopment trust fund is controlled by the CRA. It can only be expended in the boundaries of the CRA on projects and programs in an adopted CRA plan. So that's how those things tie together. So a CRA cannot spend money anywhere in the town. It can only spend money within that district. And it can't spend money on any purpose. It can only spend money on those projects and programs in the plan. So that's why this conversation is so important for the town to understand what the th thoughts are from residents and property owners about what are the priorities for those dollars to be expended. Um, the Jupiter CRA is set to sunset in about in 2034 if nothing else changes. So the remaining estimated TIF coming into the district is probably in the 30 to 32 million dollar range. That's a substantial investment. Um, and so what the town is looking for through this process is feedback from the community about what are the priorities that you think are, are things the CRA should focus on. Um, and so uh, we're here for that dialogue tonight. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, in the early days, I just wanted to give a bit of history as we carry forward. Uh, in the early days, back in 2001, the CRA adopted the finding of necessity. Um, the statute refers to conditions of what are called slum and blight, which are troubling sounding terms but they're very specific in the statute. They are areas that have deficient infrastructure. They are areas that have absentee landlords that let properties run down. They're areas that have flooding. They're areas that have crime. They're areas that have depreciation, right? Those are very specific things in statute. And those are called a finding, those are incorporated into a finding of necessity. So I had a chance to walk through the finding of necessity that was adopted in the town and working with the staff we wanted to understand how conditions have changed. So I thought, I thought the photo journey was a little interesting. So for example, in that finding of necessity document, uh, these photos were included to illustrate, for example, on the upper left-hand side where we were missing sidewalks and missing safe bike paths. Uh, on the right-hand side, areas where we were missing crosswalks and had dangerous conditions for pedestrians. So that was the CRA in 2001. Um, and today what's happening on the bottom left is the US-1 bridge under construction. We'll have a beautiful bike path and as well as a uh, sidewalk leading up onto the bridge and over. Um, and on the right-hand side, uh, on A1A, uh, the town's done a tremendous job in improving the pedestrian and bike conditions, uh, adding sidewalks, adding bike lanes, um, adding crosswalks, landscaping, um, and really framing the street to remedy that condition, right? So exactly what the CRA is intended to do are the outcomes um, that we find. Uh, on the upper left-hand side is the old Sea Sport Marina. Um, back in the 2001, identified as a property that had deficient infrastructure. It had some failing docks. It had some other negative infrastructure conditions that made it a bad neighbor, if you will, in the CRA. Uh, and on the right-hand side, uh, I think this is uh, the old Castaways property. Um, looked back in 2001, it had a deteriorating structure on it. Um, if we fast forward to today's condition, of course, the Sea Sport Marine has been replaced with Utiki, substantial investment both for in-water and dry storage, uh, boat dockage, um, no longer a, 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 um, a, a bad neighbor environmentally as it was back in, the, uh, back in 2001, but now a productive part of the, um, of the overall CRA condition. Um, and on the right-hand side, of course, castaways, you can't even see it for all the landscaping that's gone in in front of the new structures that have been built. So again, the CRA performing exactly as it was intended to. Um, and... Um, just a, another uh, set of images. 
um, on the right-hand side, that's actually the Pyatt Place property. Um, and what you'll notice in that picture is all the Australian pines that were framing uh, the uh, waterfront edge of the Pyatt Place property, which are not a contributor. In fact, they're an exotic species. Um, and then on the right-hand side, uh, that is Love Street, uh, as it existed back in the day. Um, and, of course, fast forward, Pyatt Place is a little sandy right now because it's the staging location for bridge construction. But notice there are no Australian pines left because the town took advantage of an opportunity to take those out. So, And Pyatt Place will be redeveloped over time at some point into a productive contributing use. Um, and on the right-hand side, of course, Love Street has become really a regional destination with, um, uh, with a, a, a significant amount of private investment and public investment to frame uh, the, uh, the on-street conditions as well. So as we zoom out to try to better understand what's happening in the CRA, it seems as though there are lots of successes the CRA has accomplished over time. Um, the, um, uh, the market response to, this, to the town's public investment through the CRA and through the town directly um, has generated um, a variety of improved conditions. Um, there's waterfront access points that didn't exist prior to with businesses performing an economic function to help people get out onto the water. Uh, the river walk, of course, is a, um, is a significant facility uh, that extends in pieces from Ocean, uh, Ocean Drive to the south, almost up to the bridge. And we'll talk about that alignment as part of tonight's discussion. Um, and then uh, properties like Guanabanas and Harborside, of course, um, have been in response to uh, opportunities for investment through the CRA's, um, uh, CRA's activity. Sorry about that. I pressed the key, down key too hard. There we go. Uh, um, again, the infill development in the CRA has varied um, with a lot of public-private opportunities. Um, Guanabana's Harborside, Love Street, examples of that. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, there is a legislative requirement that the updated plan will consider, and that is the need to address the peril of flood. That has to do with resiliency and sustainability for coastal conditions. The town's already adopted updated language into its comprehensive plan. And that will be part of the discussion as the CRA plan is updated as well. And just for context, I think it's also helpful to mention the town has an annual strategic plan that it updates. Um, and in that strategic plan, it identified updating the CRA um, document, the F CRA plan, as one of its strategic objectives. Um, and there are a number of factors in the strategic plan that the CRA plan can help address. For example, protecting local seagrasses, advancing living shorelines, promoting music and the arts, uh, addressing derelict vessels, which is a, a challenge for many communities. Jupiter's not unique in that condition. Um, uh, considering property acquisition, um, and also uh, considering how the US-1 bridge um, and the access to that bridge can best benefit the town, uh, which with an opportunity to extend uh, the river walk also known as the sun, part of the state's SunRail network, shared use, shared use path network, um, to capitalize on the investment by DOT in the bridge replacement. So, and there are outstanding needs um, that have been acknowledged as we've had a chance to uh, to work with the staff and talk to the um, talk to the community. Um, the Riverwalk still has gaps in the network, and so that might be an area where you think the CRA should focus. Uh, there's a need for some wayfinding. Cars driving around looking for a parking space clog up the street. So improving signage, for example, to get cars into a parking space is one of the ways we make roads safer and more efficient. So there may be an opportunity to do some of that work. Um, there has been a project over time at um, the Riverwalk uh, as it, um, as it uh, circumvents Burt Reynolds Park to create an oxbow crossing, the oxbow existing kind of behind Guanabanas, um, to go across the... Uh, uh, the Oxbow to get to uh, what ultimately becomes the Jupiter Promenade and takes you right to views of the lighthouse. So that's a project that's been in the plan um, that uh, is an opportunity for discussion. Uh, certainly, the environmental enhancement within the CRA um, is, a, um, is a popular point of discussion. And that might be an area where you think the CRA should focus um, some of its efforts uh, to continue to restore and enhance the environmental condition. Uh, the Inlet Village Marina property was acquired next to Guanabanas. Um, it has improvement opportunities that remain. Um, and the continued mobility and access through the district, safe streets for both drivers, for folks on bikes, for folks, in, uh, folks uh, that are walking um, or using other personal modes is an opportunity. 
So the Riverwalk as a particular um, facility is one of the things perhaps to talk about this evening with you to get you, to get your input. So the Riverwalk is not just a town resource, it's really a regional resource. So we don't have communities in the region that have facilities like that. So, And as a town, um, again, it was striking to find their 87% of homes are not on the water in Jupiter. Because when you look at Jupiter from an aerial, it seems like, gosh, everybody's on the water. There's so much water. But most of the town doesn't have that waterfront access in the backyard. So the Riverwalk really plays a very broad public recreational resource um, role for the town. Um, and over time, uh, the Riverwalk uh, had been envisioned to extend from, um, to extend from Harborside um, and go around Burt Reynolds Park and cross the Oxbow to go north onto the Jupiter Promenade. So on this map, the old alignment is identified with that red circle around Burt Reynolds Park, um, which was a neat idea, but it's a bit indirect if your goal is to get north and south along US-1, let's say. So as part of the discussions um, and evaluation uh, of the, for the plan update, uh, an opportunity to better align the Riverwalk along US-1 became evident. Um, and so the town has taken some actions to advance that and take advantage of state funding that's now available to construct multi-use paths like the Riverwalk. Um, and so the alignment on this map in green and blue lines uh, shows the Riverwalk alignment extending along US-1, getting up to the new bridge, uh, the Jupiter Federal Bridge, um, and in fact going beyond the bridge and taking the river walk all the way up to Beach Road. So the river walk has an opportunity to connect from Ocean Drive at the southern end all the way up to Beach Road at the northern end. Just by the way, the village of Tequesta is also working on its not river walk section, but sun trail section to improve the connections through Tequesta to go all the way up into Martin County. So um, long term, if this type of investment is successful and it becomes a priority of the town, you actually could ride a bike from Harborside, let's say, into Jonathan Dickinson State Park on a separated facility that's 10 to 12 feet wide for the most part and separated from traffic. So kind of a neat opportunity. And one of the kinds of projects that I think the town is looking for input from you as a community. Is this the kind of priority that is a priority the town should advance? And, um, and we'll have a chance to chat about that in just a bit. Um, the Jupiter Federal Bridge, of course, was a bit of an aha for FDOT. When FDOT first went in, to evaluate the condition of the bridge, it thought it was just going to do minor repairs. Um, and so it evaluated the condition of the bridge, and it sent divers down to look at the pilings. And it realized, we have pilings that are now scored from salt water um, coming in and out through the inlet to the point where they have to be replaced. If you have to replace the pilings, you have to replace the bridge. Um, and so, of course, the Jupiter Federal Bridge Boy, it's a pain to have the bridge closed while it's under construction. So we certainly have gotten feedback from that. But amen, one side of the bridge is going to open in the fall. And so um, I think it's the eastern side that's going to open in the fall, two-way traffic on one side of the bridge. And the balance of the bridge will be finished uh, next year. And then we'll have a safe facility open again. And it won't just be a safe facility. It'll be an improved facility, improved tremendously. So I have a couple of images to illustrate, if you haven't seen them already, the kinds of character that the bridge will have when it's completed. Um, for example, uh, below the bridge, FDOT will be adding the river walk uh, below the bridge along the shoreline. So our river walk investment that we make as a town, north and south on US-1, has a chance to connect to a secondary river walk section along the shoreline underneath the bridge, which is kind of a cool feature, right? So, um, uh, so, uh, uh, one of the opportunities to leverage the town's investment to capitalize on the investment dollars by others, FDOT, uh, to create a complete facility. Uh, the river, the uh, bridge will also have an observation deck below the bridge. So for those of you who remember what it used to look like, there was a little piece of the bridge underneath on the west side where I would watch kids jump off sometimes uh, and catch my breath, but it, nonetheless, it served that role. So the new bridge, when it comes back, will have an observation deck, opportunities to take advantage of uh, the picturesque views, for example, of the lighthouse um, and sunsets across the Loxachee River. Um, and then the bridge itself, of course, has an iconic design that includes lookouts on the north and south sides, both east and west. There will be four lookouts on the bridge. Um, of the things that are remarkable, this is the only bridge 
at a minimum in the Treasure Coast region, and I think it's probably on the east coast of Florida, that you'll be able to see the sunrise through the inlet from the top of the bridge in the month of September. It actually aligns, so you'll be actually see the sunrise uh, through the bridge. So Riverwalk, again, improvement, creating access to unique experiences in the town. Is that the kind of priority the CRA should maintain? One of the kinds of feedback uh, opportunities that the town is looking for through this process. Um, as I touched on um, uh, in the uh, list of outstanding needs, um, there, is, uh, there is an opportunity to add some wayfinding signage in the CRA to make the transportation network work more efficiently. So often what we find in communities is when, for example, cars are looking for a parking space, they circulate in the transportation network, they don't know where they're going, they go down the wrong street, they back out, they circulate through the transportation network again, and so that creates a couple of factors. There's cars circulating in the district that you really wish weren't circulating. So it's a risk for pedestrians, and it's inefficient because we really want the car to get into the space it's heading towards to leave the car and then spend money in the economy, if that's the focus, or enjoy the economy, the goods and services that are provided um, in, the, um, uh, in the CRA. The other opportunity is to add some gateway features. With the bridge improvement having this kind of character, when you come down the bridge and you get to the intersection of, for example, A1A and US1, it's not really particularly remarkable compared to um, the, uh, the significance of the bridge architecture, if you will. So there's an opportunity to add some gateway features um, in that location, both at the northern end, which is where the touchdown of the bridge is, and at the southern end along um, Indian Town Road. So is that an area that you think deserves some thinking from the town, some level of level of effort uh, and or investment. Uh, that's a question for, for you as we, um, as we travel the journey together tonight. So environmental enhancement and restoration is a high priority in the town of Jupiter. And the town is one of the leaders, not just in the region, it's one of the leaders in the state in using innovative technology and best practices um, to really um, materially improve the environmental condition in the town. Um, and it has a direct relationship to the resource that makes us so valuable, right? So there's a direct nexus between that investment and the CRA activity. So it's a grounded activity within the CRA that's consistent with the statute. Um, so is this an area where the CRA should focus some of its energy? Um, the, um, there's a long history of living shorelines. Um, there's the installation of um, offshore structures uh, to create habitat, um, to protect the shoreline, um, to prevent boats from... Um, uh, beaching along the edge, which is, a, uh, which is a breakdown often for the environmental condition. The river walk actually helps protect the shoreline from those boats beaching along the shore. So it actually has, interestingly, an environmental benefit as well as a transportation and recreational improvement because it can do that. It can protect the shoreline. So is this an area where the CRA should spend some of its energy? Um, should it continue to invest in environmental mitigation and enhancement opportunities? Um, that's a question for you guys uh, for this evening. There are, um, certainly as a waterfront community, there's a lot of marine activity um, in the CRA. Um, and so there are public docks that have been in, in, um, invested in over time. Um, and there's a mixed set of experiences with how those docks has, have performed. We've gotten lots of feedback through the process. Some people think the docks are a great resource to have and they're happy to have them. Others have concerns because there can be bad actors that don't use those docks in the way that people wish they would. Um, so that's an area for input uh, um, for you uh, this evening, are the dock, the dock investments, the kind of investments the town should consider, um, and, um, uh, and what are your thoughts uh, in that regard with respect to waterfront access. Related to docks in the marine condition are the anchored vessels, which sometimes are derelict vessels that exist in the waterway. And this is an area that is a really challenging piece of public policy because it takes an enormously long time to remove a derelict vessel. There's a chain of title that takes years, three, four years, to be able to remove a vessel. So not that I'm a pessimist by any regard. I have to be optimistic. I work for a regional planning council, so we're always planning on 20 years down the road. So that said, um, uh, removing derelict vessels is a public policy, um, a public policy opportunity um, it does take resources to remove derelict vessels, um, and it contributes to uh, the health and in, um, economic condition of the CRA. Um, so is that an area where you, like, uh, you, you think the CRA might want to invest some of its resources, uh, both energy or, or dollars, to improve the, um, 
to accelerate the removal of derelict vessels. Um, so that's a question for tonight. The transportation network in the CRA has lots of different projects in motion. This is the roundabout at A1A and um, Indian Town, uh, A1A and um, Beach Road. Sorry, Beach Road. Um, sorry about that. I was on the wrong intersection. Um, and, um, and there's mixed emotions about the, the roundabout, but it's part of the transportation network. Um, so we've gotten some feedback about concerns with respect to the timing of construction um, and also with respect to uh, the um, area through which bicycles and pedestrians can operate. So it's a bike lane and a sidewalk, narrowing to a sidewalk, and then opening back up to a bike lane and a sidewalk. Uh, so this is part of the transportation network. I didn't want to exclude this as part of the discussion. We've had a lot of feedback. Um, the town is already working on addressing the um, uh, the uh, the schedule of uh, construction activities, um, as well as considering um, uh, reconsidering the uh, configuration of the bicycle pedestrian facilities in that area. Uh, but is this the type of investment? the type of area where the CRA should be focused. Should the CRA be focused on transportation improvements like this one as part of its work? Um, the Jupiter Federal Bridge we have touched on, um, a significant improvement um, to the transportation network um, that will add um, additional capacity and not have to open as often. The other benefit, so traffic will flow a lot easier when that bridge is a little higher, so more, more uh, boats can get underneath the bridge when it's closed. Um, and related to the transportation network, are the pedestrian access and crosswalk improvements. Um, A1A certainly looks radically different than the condition when the CRA was established in, 2000, um, in 2003. Um, and so A1A has seen considerable investment in sidewalks, uh, bike lanes, lighting, landscaping, crosswalks. Um, we've had some feedback from folks about other desired improvements to make it safer yet. Um, so, um, oh, sorry, okay. So, uh, so is that an area where the CRA should, uh, should uh, expend effort and maintain priority um, is a question for the group. So, um, and then finally, with respect to my background slides, um, is the inventory of cultural resources. Uh, one of the remarkable things about the town of Jupiter is that it hasn't just maintained and protected, but it celebrates its historic and, cult and cultural resources. Most communities just don't have them anymore, and you can't go back and recreate a Dubois house, and you can't go back and recreate um, a uh, Jupiter lighthouse. Um, so having an inventory of cultural and historic resources, we would suggest is a, is a, real, is a significant resource um, the CRA can participate in. Um, there, are, there is ongoing information about the degree of significance some of the resources have um, as discussions are underway on key properties in the district. Um, so um, is this an area where the CRA should invest effort and priority um, to protect, enhance, and or celebrate those cultural and historic resources that we're fortunate enough to have as a place? So those are just some background slides. The purpose for tonight's workshop isn't for me to talk to you guys. It's for you guys to talk to us, two ears and one mouth. That's the end of my background slides. Uh, but I do have a series of questions for you, So because tonight we want to hear from you. Um, and um, you have town council members that are here. We're going to scribe the comments that you provide um, as members of the public. Tonight's not your only opportunity to provide input. Um, if you aren't comfortable talking on the mic, you are welcome to scan this code or go to the website, and you can just type in um, comments that we'll add to the record. Um, and additionally, <coughs> pardon me, uh, there's a website that um, uh, there's a website, uh, there's an email address for the planning department uh, where you can continue to provide information, um, and we're going to ask if you can send those uh, send those comments in maybe about the end of the month, if we can head to the next two weeks or so. So if you didn't have a chance to add your comments or you think of something driving home and you think, darn, I should have said, said this thing uh, for the town to consider, send that information in because we're here to listen to take all that input um, and then help um, help frame a plan uh, that is as informed as it can be for the town council to consider for adoption, okay? Um, so with that, a couple of very general trigger questions, if you will, just background questions. So what do you think's worked well in the CRA so far? Are there things that you love and you say, town council, CRA, do more of this because this is the thing that makes our community great. So are there things that you love? And are there challenges in the CRA? Same time. So town council, CRA board, 
man, this thing drives me crazy. Can you please address this in the CRA? Because it really bothers me. So great things, troubling things, both of those. Um, uh, are there particular outstanding needs in the CRA and the area that surrounds it? Because the town is in this conversation with you as a community to understand specifically what should happen in the CRA, but it is a town council, right? There's more of the town than just that 250 acres of upland that's in the CRA. So are there things around the CRA that you think have outstanding needs? Transportation, infrastructure, natural resources, other particular uses, lighting, landscaping, signage. Are there things around the CRA that would make the CRA more effective and more successful in your mind? Um, I mentioned the suggestion that the Riverwalk extend all the way north to connect to the lighthouse. That's an idea that came out of this process that wasn't on the plans previously. And so, amen. Not only is it now in motion, but it's in motion with funding that's going to help make that improvement happen, which is kind of a great outcome. So, um, so are there outstanding needs uh, around the CRA that you think the CRA should consider? Um, um, are there projects or programs in other places that you visited or read about that you think are things Jupiter should consider? Um, in our stakeholder outreach meetings, we've heard about San Antonio, we've heard about St. Augustine, we've heard about Austin, Texas. Everyone has a whole set of experiences they come to Jupiter with. Um, and the only thing that we're sure of is mostly there's things we don't know. So are there other places, um, other um, experiences that you've had that you think are things we should think about as we try to refine the CRA plan to make it the best we can for what Jupiter wants to do? Um, so that's a, that's a question. Um, and then finally, is there anything else you would recommend? I mean, that's a big list of things, but then there's more. So are there other things you think the CRA should think about um, as it's refining the plan um, to carry it forward for the next uh, the next decade or so? Um, so, uh, Marty, you're there with the mic. Marty's ready with the mic. So, um, so what I'm going to do is ask the team to hop over to the other laptop. Okay, team, in the back? So Dana can type on those slides. We're good? All right, so Dana, you got us. There we go. So we are going to scribe comments for tonight, um, and we are here to listen. Um, I'm not really here to answer questions on behalf of the town, although I'll do my best if there are specific ones. But really, if you have questions, we want to take those down and then follow up with thorough answers. So tonight is really for your feedback. So I'm going to ask Marty to go head around with the mic. Yeah, so I'm right? going to head around with the mic. and. Um... So if, if you have questions, middle, just raise your hand. If you're in the middle of the aisle, if you can move towards the, the, the edge. But, and, I'll, and I'll be holding on to the mic. I saw a hand here. And you have to speak into the mic, too. If it's too far away, we won't hear you. Should I tell where I live? Yeah, if you could, if you're, if you, if you could let us know if you're a resident. The condos on Saturn Street. Condos on Saturn. Got it. Okay. I love the idea that you're going to take them across the new bridge. Mm -hmm. The lighthouse. I volunteer there. Okay. And we get a tremendous amount of visitors there from other countries, from other states. That's a great idea. I don't know where it came from, but it's great. Keep it so, up. And a good presentation. The only thing I suggest, if you don't live in the area, it gets confusing with all the pictures. Yeah, uh, yeah. That, that's true. So, and that, 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 that good idea came from your town staff. So you have a tremendous staff in the town. Very creative. Super. Well, thank you for that. Thank you. Another hand? That was a river walk to the lighthouses. Good idea. Hi. Richard That's okay. Here. I'm very happy with everything I saw. I'm very proud of Jupiter. That's why I live here. I love it. Nothing is that I saw here was bad. It's an exception of one thing, and, and it's a tough one. It's the derelict buildings. Okay. I'm a boater. I go around. I, I walk on river walk, and I see them, and they're big vessels. They're not small vessels. Sure. And they seem to be having more vessels come in. I don't know if we're an easy mark for them or what. And I know it's tough to get them out. But is there something that we can do collectively to try to get these guys out of here? I know it might take a lot of money to do it, but if there's some a resource or something we can, legislation or something to get them out of here, that would really help. And then the other thing, it's not really CRA so much, but it's the train, the whistles and stuff. I live on river, off Riverside Drive. We definitely feel like we need um, we need a quiet zone for Riverside Drive, and I'm not sure everybody's on board for that, but we really need that. And just like the vice mayor said, 
we're in Jupiter, we want to have a small town feel. And with the train whistle, and now we have the bridge going up and down so much. Sure. We would really like to have a quiet zone if there's something we can do for that, too. Okay. Thank so, you. And I can actually speak to the quiet zone subject. I work on that for the region. So, And the town has submitted the paperwork necessary to get the quiet zone process started. And there's some additional safety infrastructure necessary, fencing in particular, that's already been funded, but it has to be scheduled and constructed um, uh, before the town, I think, is going to be establishing its quiet zone. So, But all of those pieces are in motion and have been. So I can speak to that part of it. So, um, And on the Anchorage, by the way, I also happen to work on Anchorages for the region. Um, and so designated Anchorages can be established. They take a pretty heavy staffing commitment, um, and you have to have a pump-out facility, either a mobile pump-out facility or a fixed pump-out facility for those vessels to be able to unload the bilge. So um, so there are mechanisms to establish it, but there's both a capital cost and there's an operating cost that continues forward as part of that. So but we'll, we'll be sure to flush that out to give those options to the town for its consideration. So. I'm Ivana Dario, and my husband and I, Captain Dominic Dario, and I have that one big vessel that's out there that has stopped it. Not of our fault, but I will tell you, Governor DeSantis, early last spring, has passed a bill where they will help derelict boats, those, for instance, like my husband, who happens to be his name, they will help those people get those boats out of there. The problem is those that aren't out of there are having, they're having problems trying to find salvagers that will actually take those boats. So um, that's the problem. And I do know, I, I watched, we lived out there for many, many years for all the winter months, for five, six years over, Watch these other derelict boats go from homeless people that will take these boats, starting out here in the inner, in their coastal, and, and moving their ways back into the, you know, behind the mangroves of the Town Road Bridge. Um, it's sad. They, you know, it's just they really, I think, really should have some type of permit to be able to do this, so that you know you are reliable and responsible for your own vessel, and the Coast Guard. They all know us, knew us anyway. Um, so we were responsible for so many years. We were able to be there. As far as facilities or bathrooms and whatnot, you have to have a Coast Guard approval um, inspection and that kind of area pro um, processing area, which we have been boarded on before and need help to bring it through. So you can live on your vessel in these designated places because these are all Coast Guard approval all the way for people coming from the north to the south of the intercoastal. They need a place to, um, you know, anchor their boats to go get some groceries, to, to go sightsee and all that, and continue up and down the intercoastal. So, um, yeah, for paying attention to this, to allow the people, the visitors and such to come back and forth, um, needs to be controlled, yes. And I apologize. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, other hands? Other hands? Uh, 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 let me just ask, Thatcher, are there any comments online? Okay. Saving green space, okay. Okay. So uh, just to repeat for the group, so Thatcher, God bless him, is uh, tracking comments that are being submitted online. And the gist is uh, positive comments with respect to the Riverwalk, positive comments with respect to the pedestrian improvements on A1A, um, and um, uh, adding additional green space. Uh, maintaining and preserving green space as the town continues to redevelop. Uh, those are the gist of comments that, uh, that we're getting. Uh, Don? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Marty, and uh, a great presentation. Uh, there's a ton of things to be celebrated in the CRA. I mean, this project after project has been successfully completed, and there's just there's so much there. There's certainly a lot more to do. Uh, one of the things that... that you know, the, I know that the landowners are very interested in seeing, and I think all of us uh, residents of the towns and, and planners that are working within the, the CRA area are very interested in. We want to make sure that the that vision continues to be carried out within the CRA plan. The existing 2012 CRA plan that can be found online contains a significant amount of vision about 
not only what the, the intent of the inlet village and the overall CRA in, uh, intercoastal waterway area is intended to be, uh, but also in terms of what that physical form is going to look like in terms of the walkability and the elimination of the parking lots and cre the creation of smaller areas where people can, can enjoy. Uh, I think that providing that is very, very important so that there's a level of predictability uh, as to what will occur uh, in, the, uh, in the balance of the CRA as it's built out over the next 10 years. So it would be, it would be, a, it would be a shame if the CRA plan does not include that visioning so that, so that the community has an expectation of what, what's gonna be there since there's been some divide uh, over, uh, over some projects and issues, as well as the landowners, because uh, we all have to remember that, that you know, they've made significant uh, investments in uh, the properties, as you pointed out, in, in, in many cases in public improvements as well. Uh, and the existing CRA plan has many, many statements about the intent to try to encourage and incentivize uh, those public improvements that then get done and are built for the benefit of the overall public. So thank you very much. Okay, super. Um, uh, well, we'll get over there. I promise you. Everybody will have a chance. So Marty's getting it. Marty's getting over there. Hi, Mark. Um, Glenn Straub, a property owner in the Inlet District. I share Don's comments on the successes within the district. They've been great and positive. I reread the plan this morning. And much of the criteria on the slum and blight that, that creates the CRA still exists. The vision is in the document. Many of the goals and objectives haven't been, um, haven't been achieved, can be achieved, and not sure that uh, the property owners within the district feel like uh, they're a part of the process in a positive way to, to, to bring the vision that Don spoke to to reality. Um, a lot of what's been achieved is low-hanging fruit. The hard work is in front of the CRA, and hopefully we can uh, be part of the process along with the town. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Marty. Thank you for the, for the presentation. Um, Brett Leone, uh, grown up here in um, grew up here in Jupiter, moved away, went to Florida State, got my master's in urban planning, and uh, saw the successes in Tallahassee of, uh, of taking a four-lane state highway, Gain, Gain Street, two-laning it, doing the, the imp undergrounding infrastructure, making it great, and in return, you know, almost a billion dollars in private investment. And so <clears throat> when I moved back, had the opportunity, uh, cool. I actually I worked with Don and through and I've, I've read the CRA plan from 2012, seen the amendments, and you know I think one of the, the great successes is for the town taking over um, A1A and being able to do a road diet and really improve the infrastructure there, which helps with some of the blight and some of the you know, missing links that you had mentioned in your presentation. So I think that's a huge plus. I think one of the challenges that we see here too, though, is um, there's pockets of unincorporated Palm Beach County in the Inlet Village. So when you're looking at it from a town standpoint, you have properties that don't fall within the regulations of what the town CRA. So I think that's something that the town should look at as a way to, to fill those, those missing pieces of the puzzle to be able to create a comprehensive plan for that whole area and not just certain pieces of property um, within that area. So just a quick thought off the top of my head and might have more in a few minutes. Thank you. Thanks. Marty, I think in the back. Got it. Hi, thanks again, Marty. We had the option of speaking a week ago or so. And uh, I think the CRA has done amazing things. I live right in the blighted area, as you might call it. I'm at the Jupiter River Mobile Home Park. For 46 years, we've looked at the intersection that is now a bunch of pylons. But Having said that, the area that they did further north of us along A1A was spectacular and the traffic calming has made a huge difference. Um, I'm here to speak about the dangers of the traffic circle and uh, the road was widened in 2016, 2017 at our southern entrance to Jupiter River Park 
and the grassy section was taken away. Now the bike lane will be taken away. So all vehicles of e-scooters, e-bicycles, joggers, strollers, elderly people on scooters will traverse our intersection at 30 miles per hour with no setback at our stop line. All the traffic will be funneled onto the sidewalk as the bike lanes will be removed and we will have people going north and south with no setback. They've widened the road and made our intersection incredibly dangerous. I do not disagree with the traffic circle. I disagree with the traffic circle in a recreation area. You talked earlier about potentially putting a nice gate or entrance when you come over the bridge and turn south along Beach Road. And I think a gate should be put at Indian Town Road. And I think the mentality when you enter from Indian Town Road to go north on Beach Road or A1A what? should be a calmed area. I think that to look at just the traffic circle as a, as a response to that area is like taking your dog to the veterinarian and only looking at the tail and the ears. We have to look at the speeders, we have to look at the danger of the traffic circle for, as a recreational area, and we need to also look at if safe evacuations because now that will be the only road if we have an evacuation. We have an ability to open Parkway Street to Du Bois, we have an ability to create three evacuation routes. We have no plan for safe evacuation in Jupiter. And I do appreciate everything that the CRA has done. I look forward to being underneath the bridge on US-1 and looking at the sunrise, so thank you. Thank you. Yeah, need, uh, need to, uh, gateways, gateways at A1A, uh, gate-1A, gateways at US-1 in Indiatown, and safe evacuation routes. It's for some reason, it's typing in dark. You ready for another question? Or are you? Yeah. Okay. My name is Robin Sophia. I live over on 755 Saturn Street. These are the condos that are right on A1A, heading into where Kempe's uh, attorney's office is. Okay. Uh, one of the concerns that I deal with on a daily basis is when we are driving down A1A, especially in front of Guanabanas, when the traffic from US-1 merges onto A1A, and we've got jetties and the catering, Pelican Club, as well as all the restaurants there. It's now from US-1 onto a two-lane highway. And Guanabanas is a problem. They consistently have an area, they put cones up, do not park here, where they've got all their lawn chairs in front. You can't e we can't even get home sometimes. It takes a, quite a bit of a time to get around people. It's 20 miles an hour to begin with, which is fine. You hit those speed bumps, and then you've got the people parking. Even Guanabanas, they are doing it. The valet does it. There's just not enough room or parking to accommodate the restaurants right now as it stands. And that is a definite issue. What's gonna happen? Where do we even have room to make those two lanes into more? You know, you've got, and with the area and the new bridge, people wanting to come down from both sides, is there any kind of uh, plan to widen that area? Okay, we'll note that. I, I'm not familiar with any plans to widen that area. So, but um, we definitely want to note uh, capacity constraint on A1A, particularly by Guanabanas. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rick Clegg. Thank you, Kimberly, for a great presentation. Um, I've been a stakeholder in the Inlet Village since '97, and a resident of Jupiter since '79. And, you know, one of my comments that I responded to was, um, boy, it seems like we, we, we've done this a couple of times. We've talked about a vision, but um, things have just, seems to occur really slowly. Um, so I'm thinking, what could be done with what's there now? And I was trying to get the town council's attention just to use the Inlet Village Marina. Um, my company, the Jupiter Outdoor Center, 
which developed one of honors, um, used to have a land use agreement with the town to just launch kayaks there. And that has fallen on deaf ears for the last five years, I think. So I just wanted to put that out there because it's something that could be done now without any improvements. Um, and I would request the town consider that again, not exclusively to my company, the Jupiter Outdoor Center, but to any company that can meet the insurance requirements the town uh, has. And because it's a great facility and it gives people more access to the water. Thank you. And to clarify, that's on the Inlet Village Marina property that's adjacent to Guanabana? Got it. Okay, did you? Um, so that's on the Inlet Village Marina property. Okay, Dana? Got it. Okay. Thanks. The city in general, the CRA has done a, a nice job with making Jupiter a destination. You know, when I travel around the country, you hear Jupiter on airplanes more as a place to go, so it's pretty cool. Uh, I was born in Miami Beach, grew up in Hollywood, and I've seen what can happen uh, uh, with uh, key areas. And I think the fear in the village, and, and I think the overall concern is the village, the residents and the, the people that live there, uh, work there, and invest there haven't gotten the, the focus that some of the surrounding areas ha have. It's made it more of a destination rather than starting from within and looking what the local residents want and making it interesting for them. And that was, as I understand it, the original vision, to have a walking around environment, peaceful, pedestrian. We've got a nice pedestrian walkway, but, but there's nobody to use it because we don't have the mixed use that was originally promised. So that's the overall concern. Uh, it's, it's less of a focus on who lives there, works there, and uh, in, invests there, and, and less on, uh, we'd like to see less on making it a destination place from the outside in and not making the whole thing like Fort Lauderdale along the waterway with nothing but restaurants. Resident focused versus investor focused. Okay. I have another one to piggyback off of that. Um, you know, the, the original vision with the CRA from 2012 is creating this pedestrian walkable village. But it's, it's almost counterintuitive when you have parking lots in the middle of a pedestrian walkable village, right? The, the whole idea of um, creating complete streets and, and mixed use developments is putting cars on the periphery, getting people out of their cars to be able to then walk around. So, you know, some of the, the vision that's in the currently in the plan, I think is, is some vision that should continue to be in it to get people out of their cars, you park somewhere, and you make it a comfortable walk, whether, you know, additional landscaping's needed, shade structures, you know, inter multimodal um, pathways for people to traverse between other areas, making, making it comfortable. You know, we all know 90% of the year, it's pretty hot here. Right? We're, we're in the most beautiful time of the year in this area. Um, and to, to the gentleman's point that just spoke is, the cat's out of the bag. I mean, Jupiter is, is one of the best places in the country, if not the world, to live in, and people know it. You know, you have um, Discover the Palm Beaches, which boasts about Jupiter and, and other areas in our county. Um, Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council, you guys do a great job with, you know, projects all, you know, from here north and um, you know, really trying to help make places great. And so I hope that that vision creating this walkable pedestrian village isn't lost in, in everything that we're going through, but obviously still still keeping in mind what, what the residents want, what landowners want, and uh, and continuing to just build on, on what we've done, and hopefully it's done a little bit faster, because I do agree that, that it's been a little bit slow getting there. And so now, as more people move here, move down here permanently, you know, thanks to COVID, people were here five, six months of the year. Now those people are here year round. So it feels like it's seasoned year round. And so that's, that's a, a pro and a con, right? It's great for the businesses and, and the, the community that way. But then at the same time, it's a con for us because we're all like, wow, traffic's terrible year round. It's just something I think we have to deal with, but we can in the Inlet Village, very similar to what was done in Abacoa, right? It's people walk to the downtown, downtown Abacoa, get out of their cars. I moved back home moved into Abacoa growing up, I was like, I don't want to live five feet from my neighbor. Studying urban planning, now I, I understand the, the, the urban framework that it was designed, and I think there's an opportunity to continue to keep that in the CRA plan to uh, keep it a walkable village. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Let me pause, pause for a moment. Anything else online that we should note? 
Okay, emphasis for this area to preserve historic structures. Concerns over traffic. Sorry? Do you want, um, you want to go ahead? All right, so I'm, par I'm parroting for, for Scott, uh, for uh, Thatcher. Um, um, uh, okay, concerns over overdevelopment. Uh, 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 emphasis on environmental restoration, particularly water quality and living shorelines. Okay, those are the gist of comments. Okay, super. Uh, other comments from the crowd? Hi, we love the Jupiter River Walk. My husband and I are fortunate to live at Mangrove Bay. So the River Walk basically is our backyard. And we watch the traffic go by and people riding their bikes and really turning around every so often to just to go, oh, look at that. It's a wonderful thing. Um, but I do have some concern about what happens to these facilities once they're, quote, done. Mm -hmm. um, we walk that river walk many times a day with our dog, and the amount of garbage that has been thrown off boats that has floated into those mangroves <coughs> is crazy, especially south of that lagoon bridge by the Merrill Lynch facility. There's okay. plastic everywhere. It's really an embarrassment. Um, the uh, landscaping, the greenery there, so many trees that are just a mess. It really needs to be attended to. Grasses that have died since they were originally put in that are just gone. And so now the structure going off the edge of the river walk looks to me to be partially threatened in some places. Okay. So that would be my suggestion and question is what happens when these things are done? Who's looking after this property? Okay. And, and I can actually address that in part. It's not the CRA, because <laughs> CRAs are designed to construct facilities, but really not maintain them. So the maintenance of those facilities always reverts back to the local government ultimately. So it becomes a town facility uh, at, the, at, at the completion of construction uh, for the town to maintain as part of its recreational inventory. So, but it's good that we note the need for landscaping improvement right, and garbage. able to tell us who to talk to specifically about that would be great because I've made yep. a bunch of phone calls and I've gotten no sure. response. Sure. We'll, we'll communicate that back to the town. And, and the nice thing about this process is that all the town departments have been engaged in the discussion. And so they're very aware to the feedback that we've been getting through interviews and through the workshop. I know the town staff is watching. The ones that aren't, the staff that isn't here are watching the workshop also. So, so those concerns are all going to be funneled back to the town so the town can be really efficient in addressing those concerns. Okay. Hello, I'm Joe from Borg. I'm a 20-year resident of Jupiter. I love this place. Best place on earth. Um, I work right next to the new bridge project. It's going to be a nice, tall new bridge. And also, conjunction, very nice new building and very comfortable chairs here. But uh, I was just thinking in terms of the overall Jupiter Inlet Village area, like, I feel like a lot of the areas, mainly sprawling parking lots, uh, in covering the view, so the, the the best view goes to parking lots. I feel like so I think that needs to have some people take a look at uh, uh, increasing uh, the, uh, the height restrictions for the overall area, as well as providing structured parking so as to consolidate some more of the parking to allow for more mixed use development, so as to keep the whole Jupiter Village area kind of alive and growing and keep it uh, keep it fun and exciting. Okay, thanks. And, and building height as a strategy, as a suggestion. Um, uh, yes? Uh, the town council created the Inlet Village Flex Zoning that allows development of smaller lots in keeping with the village scale of development. My property is one of them. I want to keep, I live on A1A, just south of Guanabanas. Um, I want to keep a use by right for property owners of undeveloped land in the comprehensive plan and zoning ordinances. We have counted on that zoning for many years and our ability to get the building permits for smaller projects needs to be retained and protected. The vision for the inlet village is incomplete. More parking must be provided for the public. It is urgently needed. A two or three story parking garage at either Love Street or Parkway would blend in camouflage by colorful flowers and lush trees. 
Other projects, like the inlet, Jupiter Inlet Waters, or the Kempe Oxbows, have buildings that would complement a three-story parking garage and be consistent in height. It would also help blend in the whole tech building height. The vision is clear for the Sunny Sands site, and I support the Sunny Sands project. It is an essential parcel to complete the inlet village. Give a respectful designation to the former native residences that came before us, a historic hotel, small outdoor breakfast, lunch cafes, souvenir and art studios, cheese shop, and a deli. Other retail shops are also needed. A variety of options would give residents and guests more reason to come to the inlet village other than to visit restaurants. I oppose a park for the village because we have too many parks in close proximity. And I also noticed uh, you have a river walk going around Burt Reynolds Park, which I think is unnecessary and a waste of money because all they're doing is looking over at all the residences in the trailer park, uh, Kempe's, Inlet Waters, myself, Anna, Barron's Landing, <coughs> Guanabana's. There's nothing natural and beautiful about that, so to speak that should be kept to the Riverwalk area and on that intercoastal way. Okay. So, and, and just to clarify, the town's primary alignment now for the Riverwalk would be along US-1. So it shifts it away from circumventing the park. So. Um, I'm glad you mentioned Sunny Sands. There is a huge contingent here from Jup Jupiter Inlet condominiums. Everybody here in front, we are very concerned about what's going to go next door um, in the sunny sands. Um, the, the city keeps talking about a park. Well, a park would be nice, except we don't want a park like Du Bois Park because on the weekends, it's, it, it, it's packed. There are barbecues going. The trash cans are overflowing. The music, the noise. This is residential. Um, we certainly don't need another restaurant along there, and we certainly don't need another hotel. Um, I think before anything about Sunny Sands is decided, I really do think that we should be, we should have our input because we are right next door. There are 120 units there with a lot of people. And um, before the city decides what should go there, I really do think that we should be included in the conversation. Okay. Okay. Other thoughts from the public? I think the gentleman behind you. I'm surprised you didn't mention the Gaines Street bioswale, because when I looked at Gaines Street in Tallahassee, that's the first bioswale I saw in Florida. Um, this one touches on the environmental enhancements, you know, you had talked about in there and showed some pictures, but, you know, we hear in the news way too often that Du Bois Park is closed because of high bacteria levels. You know, if, if there's any way to do some sort of improvements along the inlet, along, you know, that area to help improve water flow, I mean, that's historically the inlet, right? The inlet moved over time, opened, closed, and then the Army Corps came in and, and cut the jetties that we have today. So, you know, uh, Du Bois Park is a, is a great benefit to, to our community. Uh, I know it's owned by Palm Beach County, but if there's any way that the town can also, you know, work with the county or the Corps or DP, whoever, to help improve water flow through that area so we're not having to close that park down, um, that would be a, a huge benefit as well. Thank okay. you. Okay, super. Um, yep. Joe. You know, Sunny, everybody here knows Sunny Sand is an important uh, property, and you know, making it a park just makes it more of a destination. And again, you lose sight of the, the people that are neighbors and work there and live there. Um, so I, I think most, well, a large contingency here is uh, that's the, the main focus. And that's really the main property that would carry the mixed use forward uh, if it's done right. Uh, it's a unique property. It has a, one thing I've learned in Jupiter going through certificate of dig processes is half the people want to see what's under there and the other half want to leave it alone. But that that offers, I mean, and part of my uh, uh, approvement process, I have to create key 
um, cultural displays and interesting things which promotes that walking around environment and to me that should be the focus of a property such as that and some of the vision that uh, Mr. Modica had in that was I think valuable uh, and, and I think appropriate and I think a lot of people would like it if it's done right. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think next to uh, Mr. Campy. Uh, thanks very much for the presentation. But on some of the before and afters, it would be great if you just labeled, because they look familiar, most of them. Yeah, it was hard for me to figure them out, to tell you the truth. So, and I lived in Jupiter for about five years. So in just speaking uh, to what you're saying about Du Bois Park and the toxin, do we, how do we coordinate as far as other regional, you know, CRAs with, you know, Lake Okeechobee? Because several times it was closed because of the sargasso that came, you know, from the release. So how is that coordinated? So, so, the, um, so I'll speak on behalf of the town for a moment. So the town, uh, the, 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 not the CRA, but the, the town, right, uh, has intergovernmental relationships with all of the public agencies. Um, and municipalities together um, exist in a league of cities um, that make, a, make an individual municipal voice stronger, if you will. Um, and so that coordination is actually part of the town's required protocol. The way it does business is in coordination with those agencies. There's things we can control as a town. Discharges from Lake Okeechobee of clearly aren't one of those. That's a water management district call. Uh, but that, that coordination is, is underway. Um, and um, noting the concerns about the water quality issues in, in Dubois, I, I read those headlines also, so we're familiar with that. Um, it's a... Uh, it, I don't know that there's necessarily a clear role for the CRA other than an advocacy one. I think the larger um, uh, productive role is the town's actions with respect to those discharges and water quality issues. But the CRA can certainly support um, cleaner waterways and that coordination activity. So, but it's a little it's a little beyond the scope a bit, I think. Absolutely it is, and certainly something to be noted as one of the goals in the district, right, to maintain healthy waterway and water we can swim in and water we can drink, so catch fish in and actually eat if we want to, right? Um, yes? I don't know if there's any other comments and how much. I know you wanted to try to close it up. By so, five. yep, so um, uh, anything else um, online? Okay. Hi, just uh, some thoughts as a resident. Okay. Um, just seeing A1A over the last decade there in the Inlet Village area, I think the improvements of it have been great, but it just doesn't really seem like it can be improved any further to accommodate any more traffic, especially at dinner time when that half a dozen restaurants that are there now have, are all very packed. So I think whatever the additional development in the Inlet Village area needs to not be restaurants, you know, stores okay. and shops, something like that. But it also needs to, with the uh, the former Paha Villas property, Sunny Sands, if the boat yard area or the Kempe West are ever developed, um, having something there that is not going to be so developed that it's going to make the road have more traffic than it can accommodate, and it's really getting close to that sometimes already. Um, the other thing that I've seen, you know, working at the lighthouse, is the living shoreline that's been put in on the south side. That if people have visited the lighthouse lately, or if they've come by boat lately. Um, can see that it, we've been very pleased with how that's worked out in terms of bringing in marine life and improving the shore there. So certainly anything in in, in or near the uh, inlet village area, especially along the river walk, living shorelines to improve the water quality, bring in more wildlife, improve the shore resilience and the uh, resistance against storm surge and things like that, certainly encourage that. Okay. Thank you. Super. I think there's one more in the back. Good evening. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak. I'm here on behalf of uh, the Lessings Hospitality Group and supporting the other business owners and property owners in the area um, through uh, you know, the multiple opportunities for us to come together and have communication. So thank you again, Kim, in previous weeks. Uh, we've learned a lot in the last couple of weeks um, as a team and as a community, and we just continue to want to be involved in uh, projects moving forward, and especially with priority projects that are funded. Um, we also are incredibly appreciative for the funding that has gone towards some of the sidewalks and the use of the CRA funds towards Love Street. So 
uh, I didn't want to miss the opportunity to thank the whole team for collaborating on that new area. So thank you. Super. Okay. Um, all righty. So I have my for more ideas slide up. So if there's another idea that you have that you didn't want to share or you think of it in the car on the way home or you talk to your neighbor and they say, hey, for, let's add this to the record. This slide has that contact info. So there's a, um, again, you can take home with you a little brochure that has the code to scan with your phone. There's also a website address, which is that pollcode.us slash LBGYGH, which is just rolls off your tongue. But that's the website address where you can access um, a, survey, um, a survey mechanism to add comments. Pardon? That's a nine. Even worse, LGBY9H. So that's the font breakdown there. So if you couldn't access it before, that's the reason, because the 9 looks like a G. Um, but beyond that, um, the town, of course, has an email address. Um, so if you want to email just comments to the project team, the best address to use is planning zoning. No ampersand or anything in between those two. So planning zoning at jupiter.fl.us. Um, this presentation will be on the town's website. I saw some of you taking pictures, which I always feel really good as the presenter, that there was a slide that was worth taking a picture of. But that said, uh, the whole presentation will be available on the website and available in a PDF form if you want to get a copy of it. Um, and, um, and I always like to close with the Perry Como slide, right? Because And good night to that little piece of paradise called Jupiter, Florida. What a wonderful place to be. So, um, so thank you on behalf of the town. Uh, thank you for participating tonight. Um, good governance happens when there's good participation. So we always feel very strongly as a team that the most informed decisions by elected officials are the best ones. And that's how elected officials make decisions with confidence, when they really feel as though there's been good opportunity for public input, and at least they're aware. It doesn't mean every decision goes your way, though I always like to make sure that people are aware of that. However, Having the ability to provide that information and having the ability for your elected officials to consider that as part of the process is what makes for good democracy. So thank you for spending your time with us tonight. Um, uh, there is um, a thank you slide at the end. Um, and um, uh, and uh, please look to the town's website for additional information as to when the plan updates are available for review and when the, um, uh, when the, town, when the town council sitting as the CRA board will begin its public uh, hearing process uh, to uh, consider those amendments. Okay? So, and with that, any other questions, comments from staff? Cover everything, staff? We're good. And from the elected officials, we're good. So, all right, guys, have a great night. Thank you.